Well, greetings to all of you here in uh, Grayson, Kentucky. A beautiful day, beautiful Sabbath day, beautiful uh, outside. Uh, leaves are, I think they've already changed. Uh, they're now they're beginning the stage of falling off, but they're still beautiful and they, they're very pretty. You know, anyone that studied the Bible for any period of time will understand that there's two ways of life. Um, God's way, and of course Satan's way, or we call it sometimes the way of the world. It's compared in different ways. You can say it's good versus evil, uh, light versus dark, uh, peace versus chaos, uh, life and death. Uh, we read in Deuteronomy 30 and 19, I've set before you life on one hand, death on the other. Uh, sometimes it's called the straight and narrow path. Uh, that's God's way, and then the broad way that leads to destruction, another way. A lot of parallels between God's way of life and the way of the world. Today I want to take one aspect of the world and compare it to one aspect of God's way of life. And I have a reason for that. When I finish, I think you'll understand uh, why I'm taking this approach. First of all, let's look at the world's way. Now, we're all in the world. We're all, you can't live without being in the world. You're associated with it on a daily basis everywhere you go, whether it be in school, in uh, your homes, your communities, whether you're traveling on the highway, whether you're in business, you can't get out of the world. So you're able to see a lot of the things that are taking place in the world. Particularly lately, if you've been watching any television at all, we've just finished the midterm elections. You can see the political aspects of the world manifested on uh, your television uh, and through the elections. But I want to take you back and show you a tendency that the world has. Now, it won't take you long to figure out once we uh, start discussing it. But I want you to go back with me to Genesis 10th chapter. And I'll show you way back in the early days, uh, Genesis 10. This is shortly after the flood when life had been destroyed except for Noah and his three sons and um, their wives and Noah's wife. Eight people were saved. In Genesis 10, should be there by now, uh, read verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. These are the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham and Japheth, and from those three sons and their wives, we see the population and extent today. And unto them were sons born after the flood. It goes on and it lists these uh, sons. But let's go down to uh, verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Now here we see where God is beginning to divide these various nations. You see, when they first started off with Shem, Ham, Japheth, Noah, they, as they had children, they were families. They started off as families, and the, and the more the families reproduced, then they got into colonies, and they began to uh, get larger. And eventually, they would become nations. It says, everyone after his tongue, after their families, and in their nations. And when you study this, you'll see that there were approximately 70 Gentile nations extended at that time. Now I want to go down to verse 8, and it says, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now when you do any study at all, you will find out that this Nimrod was a mighty hunter against the Lord. And you begin to understand why he was against the Lord. And it says in the beginning in verse 10 of his kingdom was Babel or Babylon and Erech and Akkad, Kalneh in the land of Shinar. So what happened after the flood? All those animals that were released from the ark after the water receded began to go out and begin to reproduce. And there were a lot of wild animals in the land. So Nimrod was a mighty hunter. A big, strapping black man, strong, powerful, uh, charismatic. He was able to protect the people from these wild animals. He came up with the idea, all right, let's all get together. Let's, let's form a, uh, a community here, and then we can build a fence around our community, around our family, and I will protect you. 
Now, what he began to do was take the eyes of the people off of God Almighty and begin to focus on him. Now, you'll have to go elsewhere to find the story about Nimrod and Semiramis, his wife. Semiramis was a powerful lady as well. And from these two people began the Babylonian mystery religion. And a lot of their religious beliefs originated because the people began to look to Nimrod as their god. Well, story has it that Shem tracked him down, killed him, cut him up in pieces, and sent his body around to the various uh, nations as a, uh, a reminder of what happens when you go against God. But Semiramis wasn't finished. So apparently she must have had, she was either pregnant uh, upon his death or had an illegitimate child named Tammuz. And she began to promulgate the idea that this Tammuz was a rebirth or reborn Nimrod. And of course every year around December the 25th they began to promulgate the idea that Nimrod who was uh, coming back in the form of the sun was the sun god. And so they developed this mystery religion based upon this concept. Of course, Tammuz being the sun, which I don't know how she was able to get people to believe it. I believe you can get people to believe just about anything uh, if they want to. She began to say that Tammuz, the sun, was reborn. He was Nimrod reborn, so he was in the flesh, the son of God. You begin to see how this religion mimicked the religion, the true religion of Jesus Christ. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a little background on that because here's where we go to in Genesis 11, we see what this Nimrod did, this mighty man before he was killed. It says the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. They all could understand one another, communicate with one another. Language is probably the easiest means of communicating. If you if you can't understand someone, it's difficult to communicate with them. But they all spoke the same language all throughout the earth. It was extended at that time. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. Oh yes, they had building supplies, building materials. They were going to build, they were going to construct a city. And a tower, a tower that would reach up into heaven. And they were going to worship that tower. I'm sure it had some um, symbolic meaning of Nimrod. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name. Oh yes, let's make us a name. Let us be powerful. Let us be known throughout the world. Let us be respected. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They were united. So give you any inkling of what's taking place today when people start talking about a one world government. The idea in man has never changed. Mankind just wants to unite. But of course, Nimrod wanted to control that one world government. He was going to bring all the people under his regime. And they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. You think of the things that people imagine to do today, of the various religions and the peculiarities associated with many of those religions. There are people that actually worship Satan the devil and other mysterious things. So they said in verse 7, go to let us. Now notice he said let us. This is God the Father and Jesus Christ talking. Go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to the, build the city. They had to stop. They couldn't communicate. <laughs> Probably the chief engineer couldn't communicate with all the builders down there. So God was able to stop it. In verse 9, therefore is the name of it called Babel. Yes, confusion. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Verse 10, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and beget, or fact said, two years after the flood. So we see here the human tendency is they wanted to do what? 
They wanted to unite. They wanted one world government. And the premise that Nimrod based upon was he wanted power. He wanted to control the people. And that's the way it is in the world. If you look at the various governments around the world today, you'll see usually some dictator, some person who wants to uh, exempt power over other people. That's a tendency among human beings. Now let me show you also over in Daniel, the second chapter. Daniel, second chapter. As time proceeded, time went on. And we come to the point where God had brought the nation of Israel. And at this particular point, uh, the Jews have gone into captivity in the book of Daniel. In Daniel 2, let's notice verse 26. Now, Daniel was a captive, one of the Jewish captives, by the Babylonians. Now, the Babylonians had, this kingdom of Babel had continued to grow and grow and grow. And at this particular period of time, it was a world-ruling empire. It had grown and was actually able to control the world around it. So Babylon was a mighty and powerful nation and country. The king began to have dreams. And he couldn't understand what they meant. And his astrologers and his wise men couldn't interpret those dreams. But someone told him, well, you have one of the captives, one of the slaves, that is able to interpret dreams. And he said, well, bring him before me. So we begin reading in Daniel 2 and verse 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto you? Can you, can you not get your people to give an answer? And Daniel went on to say, but there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. He didn't take the credit. He didn't take um, uh, any acknowledgement upon himself that he was able to interpret these dreams. He gives God the credit. And he makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Now, this dream that he saw was at that time going to take place and was going to run all the way up to the latter days, the days that you and I are living in today. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed are these. So he begins to interpret the dreams. Let's go on down to verse 31. Here's what he says. You, O king, saw. He's telling him what he saw. God is revealing this to Daniel. You behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before you, and the form thereof was terrible. It was an awesome figure. He could see this great image standing there before him. Now he's beginning to explain what it is. The image, or this image's head, was a fine gold. Now we come to understand that this fine gold, this, this image of the head of fine gold was Babylon. And he'll explain that. And his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. Then it went on down. This is an image of a man, a, a huge man. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. So he begins to explain to him what this is. Now go down to verse 37. And he says, You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power and strength and glory. God allowed Nebuchadnezzar this power. He gave him that and he put him in that position. You see, people don't understand sometimes that God is in charge. That God knows exactly what's taking place in the world today. He is in charge of all the elections that take place. Of the various kingdoms around the world. He allows things to take place. He allows things to happen. If someone is put in an office, God allows it. Unless he wants to remove them. So he allowed this king, Nebuchadnezzar, to be in office. And wherever, now notice what he says here. And wherever the children of men dwell. That means on this earth. The beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven has he given into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. He's saying you are a world ruling king. He had control of the world at that, that known part of the world at that time. He said it doesn't matter. All the people you have control over them. All the beasts of the field you have control over them. And after you 
as we come on down and we see his breast and his arms of silver, as we begin to uh, come on down, and he says, after you shall arise another kingdom. It'll be inferior to you. And that would be the Medes and the Persians. History will tell you this. You can look it up. These world ruling empires and all in, in these confines. Then comes the third kingdom of brass. That, of course, is the Greco-Macedonian Empire, which shall bear rule over all the earth. World ruling empires. They wanted to engulf the, the world around them. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all things, these, shall it break in pieces and it shall bruise. And whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Now the Roman Empire, well, it, this represents Rome, and the Roman Empire was divided into two kingdoms, with a, a capital at Rome, one at Constantinople. So we see that this empire was divided, then it continues to go on down, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. So this, these legs it, are made with iron and miry clay. And then it comes down to verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now we understand that these ten toes are going to be ten kingdoms that rise up in the latter days. This is, as it, as it begins to come down from this image, from the head of gold, the, uh, followed by the Medes and the Persians, then the greco macedonians then the Roman Empire, then we come down to the ten toes that will be extant in the last days, probably manifested by the European Union. And it says, and whereas you saw iron mixed with miry clay, in other words, the iron and the clay, it will be a mixture, but it, won't be, it will be held together by possibly economic reasons or political reasons, but... It will be brought together, but it won't be very strong. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So here we see another world ruling empire. Now what is, what is the characteristic about these world ruling empires? What have we known about Babylon? What have we known about the Medes and the Persians? The greco macedonian the Roman Empire. What did they do? They conquered, didn't they? They... You know, Alexander wept after he had conquered the world because there were no more empires to conquer. He wept because that's the way they were. That's the way it is in the world. They want, they want to be large. They want to be big. They want to, to get. It was a way of achieving, a way of accomplishing. And each one of these kingdoms was a world ruling empire. They were never satisfied. They always wanted more. The way of these empires was the way of get. And they would take it and they would conquer, and they would acquire. They always wanted to magnify themselves. Now that is a tendency among the world. I don't care what aspect you look at. I don't know whether it be in a family. You can look in communities. You look in academia. You can look in politics. You can look at uh, these powerful, wealthy men like Microsoft and the people in, in oil and uh, steel, the different uh, companies. They just want to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, don't they? They want to, to get. That is the way of the world. Get. To achieve. Accomplish. Now let's look at it from a religious perspective. I want you to turn with me over to 2 Peter 2. In 2 Peter 2, this is the same chapter you were at in the sermonette, I believe. He covered part of this. But... Uh, we're going to look at a little different aspect here in 2 Peter 2. Now, Peter was writing some 30 years after Christ had been sacrificed. Peter saw it with his own eyes. Peter was one of the apostles that was sent forth to preach the gospel into all the world. Peter was an original member of the church of God. When Christ said, I will build my church, he was talking to Peter right there. Now, upon the day of Pentecost, and so many people don't even understand what the day of Pentecost means. Pentecost was the holy day in which God began the pouring out of his Holy Spirit to people that he would call. Pentecost. That's what it, that's what it was all about. Peter says, that's what this means. This is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So Peter had seen a lot. He saw the persecution in Rome. 
He saw the division. He saw the people that were hung up on stakes, that were uh, burned alive. He saw all this. And he also saw, and wasn't able to stop it, from the founding of the church in 31 A.D. As the years continued to progress, he began to see an infiltration of false ministers. He couldn't stop it. We can't stop it today. It's, it's happening and it's going to happen. But he, he sees this and he's trying to warn the people, like we always try to warn the people, about what's taking place. So that's the background when we come to this second letter that Peter was writing in verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. You know, we read that scripture, and I don't know what goes through your mind when you read that. I don't know if you're even able to recognize it when you see a false prophet or a false teacher. I don't really know what ability you have to discern these things. But prophecy says that there shall be false teachers among you. Now, they operate, in many cases, will privately will come in bringing damnable heresies. They will, they will do it secretly, sometimes with small groups. They will, introduce, they will introduce a topic that it looks like the truth, and they have a way of doing it. I wish I could give you examples. I don't have the ability, and thank God I don't. But I remember going through the, the period of time when the worldwide had its implosion, and they began to introduce these false doctrines, and I remember one about the hypostases. I vividly remember the fact that they said, we're not teaching the Trinity. When they said there are three hypostases, and each one of these hypostases, three and one. And I said, how in the world can that be anything else but the Trinity? But they said it wasn't. Now, a lot of people didn't get it. And they were able to be hooked in. So, you better know what the Scriptures say. And you better understand from the first part to the end part of God's plan, you've got to study and you've got to know what truth is and what isn't truth, or else you could be deceived. And when I hear certain things that are going on within God's church today, it does bother me that God's people don't see and understand the difference between truth and what is a lie. Now, a lie is part truth and part lie. I don't care if it's 99% truth and then 1% not true, it's still a lie. The truth is the truth. So you've got to be able to discern that. And that comes through study of God's Word and heartfelt prayer, asking God to guide you and not be deceived. So Peter's trying to tell these people he says, they're going to come in and they're going to bring these damnable heresies. Now, it's not going to be something blatant. It's not going to be somebody to come up and stand up and say, no, we're, not, we're going to start worshiping on Sunday rather than Saturday. Well, it did, but it come over a process of time with the worldwide, and I can't imagine that people did it, but they did because they changed all these other things around. And I don't know how, except through subtleties, and except maybe the people weren't called, I, I can't answer it. I don't know. It just baffles me to even think today. But I remember how I got, sometimes I'd get a little confused. I'd read their articles, and I always wanted to read what the church put out. But it wasn't the same old story that I once heard. I'd tell my wife, I said, you know, when I first started studying this materials, I always understood it. Now it's not as clear. It's not as plain as it was. I don't understand it. God is not the author of confusion. So, it comes very subtly. And Peter's trying to tell them that they would deny the Lord that bought them through his death and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, notice verse 2. Notice it says, And many, many would follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Now, that evil spoken of means it's maligned. It's twisted. It's, it may be compromised with to a degree. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words 
They'll make merchandise of you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. They, make, they use God's people to merchandise them. Even though they may be preaching love, compassion, and bring the various doctrines of the church in, they have a way of doing it. And it, it is not God's way. Now, it is not about numbers. It's not about seeing how many groups we can get together. You see, that's the way of the world, is to try to bring in numbers. God is about something else. And we heard some of that in the uh, sermonette, what God is about. I'll elaborate on that just a little bit more when we talk about God's way. But you see, when you look at the ways of the world, when you look at... I think we can take the televangelists. I, I, I would hope that most of you can. Now, there's people listening to my voice today that may have never heard some of the things that I'm saying. They may not know about the Sabbath. They may not know about God's plan of salvation. They may not know that God is a family. They may not know about the holy days. But they, if they will continue to study, you will learn these things. But you see, when you look at the televangelists and you go into a coliseum that is literally filled up with thousands upon thousands of people that paid a price to get into that religious meeting, that is not God's way. As the evangelist who is very charismatic, many times could be very handsome, very articulate, but not very knowledgeable in what God's plan of salvation is, but nonetheless he has something that he can give to those people that they like. They may leave feeling good about themselves. They may leave uh, encouraged, inspired, uplifted. And all the time that he's speaking, he has these ushers that are passing the, what, a basket, a barrel, a plate, back and forth. And by the time they leave, they leave with garbage baskets full of money, making merchandise of you, with feigned words, uplifting you, encouraging you. So we see the way of the world. It is big. It is a way of get. But that's not God's way. God's way is different. Now let me explain about God's way. We looked at the way of the world. Let's look at God's way. And that's something that I've had to think about. And I wonder, I don't know how many of you listening to my voice today by way of this DVD were ever in the worldwide church of God. I know there are a lot of people out there that were. At one time, I believe there are at least 150,000 people. There were congregations all over the world. The first feast that I went to was in Jekyll Island, Georgia, Georgia with about seven to 8,000 people sitting under a huge tent. I'd never in my life seen anything like it. The little Methodist church that I used to attend, if we had 23 people at that particular church in a little small uh, coal mining community in West Virginia, uh, it was a big crowd. But at this time, we went to the Feast of Tabernacles, and there were thousands of people. There were other feast sites that had 12 to 15,000 people, some in St. Petersburg, uh, Florida, some up in Poconos, down in Pasadena, down in Texas, all over the world. So it was a large group. And I wonder sometimes if that's what God wanted. Did he want large numbers? Because that's not the way he operates. Now, I don't know why it happened. I don't know why so many people were in the church at that time. It seems to be totally different today as we try to preach the gospel. It just doesn't seem to have that same magnetic uh, draw that it once had in those early days. I remember when we first heard it on the radio, we were absolutely overwhelmed. Couldn't get enough of it. We wanted everything that we could possibly get. Every article that we could read, we read it. Correspondence courses, we just engulfed it. Staying up late at night reading it and so forth. I don't know if that same enthusiasm is there today. I don't even know if it's among God's people with that same enthusiasm today. But I know how it was. And that's why many people came. They were willing to give up jobs. 
they were willing to give up at that particular period of time. They had to, if they were married and divorced, had to give up their mates. And a lot of them did it because they wanted to obey God. See, but it was big. It was huge. And I wonder, knowing some of the things that transpired behind the scenes, within the confines of that church, I wonder if God was pleased with that. And here's the reason I'm saying that. In John 1, in verse 1, we see that in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning of what? Well, in the beginning of time. It had to be when time started. But in the beginning was the Word. Well, the Word was the Logos. The Word was Jesus Christ. He is the spokesperson. But you see, there were two of those gods. Remember it said, let us go down and confound the languages. In Genesis 1.1 it says, in the beginning God. The Hebrew word for God is Elohim. It's plural. It means more than one. So here we see another description of this same verse. In the beginning was the word, which was Christ. And the word was, you can't change the scripture around. It was with God. He was with the Father. So the word... Jesus Christ and the Father have existed forever. But at some point in time there was a beginning. No doubt when they started creating and keeping time. So the point I want to make here is there was two of them. Only two gods. God the Father and Jesus Christ. Two. And you'll see so many times in God's plan too. He, he uses two for whatever reason. And he has a reason. So with that in mind, at some point in time, he says, son. At that time, he wasn't son. But he said whatever he called him. He said, let's reproduce ourselves. Let's create a family that's like us. Let's create a family that thinks the way we do. That is made of the same composition that we are. And let's increase it. But let's don't do it all at once. Let's take our time. Let's make sure that every single one that we bring into this family proves themselves first. Let's test them. Let's try them. Let's take them to the limit to see if they'll obey us. See, he, he did that because he had created a great archangel named Lucifer who rebelled against him. And so he's, he learned a lesson. And so he said, now let's create these two people, man and woman. You will, you'll know them as Adam and Eve. Let's create them in flesh and blood. And he says, let's let them grow up in flesh and blood. And if they want to obey us, and they want to become like us, then at some point in time, we'll change them. Once they've reached the point where their character and their mind is set, and we know they will never turn from us. But they said, well, we don't want to force this on them. No, we want to give them a choice. So he said, well, what can we do? He said, well, I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's put two trees down there in this garden we're going to put them in, and, and let's let those two trees symbolize something. One of them, let's let it symbolize our way, the way of love, the way of get, the way of outgoing concern, and then we put this other tree over here, the knowledge of good and evil, which lets them to decide what's right and wrong and the way of doing it your way. Okay, let's do that. So they created this man first, then the woman came from the man, and there's two beautiful specimens, beautiful creatures, created in the image of God, but flesh and blood, not spirit. He says, all right, you choose. So what did they do? They chose to decide for themselves. Well, God couldn't change them at that time. But that didn't thwart his plan. It just caused him to take a different approach. He did nonetheless tell them, he says, you reproduce and replenish the earth. Because what did he want to do? He wanted to bring, Hebrews 2.10, many sons and daughters into glory. Glory is in the spiritual image of God. So, in order to do that, he says, let's go ahead, let human beings reproduce. And they did. And for 6,000 years, they've been doing just that. 
And they're all over the world. All these little potential gods just running around doing their own thing. Making up their own mind what's right and wrong. Choosing for themselves. Choosing mates. Choosing to go to school. Choosing different professions they can live in. Uh, choosing for themselves what is right and wrong. Whether they want to read the Bible. Whether they want to ignore the Bible. Whether they want to worship the evolution. They, he just lets them do what they want to do. And sure enough, they've done it. But God always starts small. Remember, there was only two of them. Then he started with a man and a woman. And he let them reproduce. So here's all these people out here that are not following his way. They've rejected his way of life. But that won't thwart God's plan. So somewhere during the process of time, there was a fellow born by the name of Abram. He looked down at that man and he must have had instruction somewhere along the line because your Bible says Abram obeyed God. So God says, I think I can use you. I want you to be a father of these many nations. Now what he was in essence saying, he said, I want to make a covenant with you and it's going to be twofold. First he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. He's talking about physical blessings. Then the second thing he says, through you, Abram, I'm going to bless all these nations. Well, you, do you know what that means? Well, first of all, he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. So he allowed Abram to have a son named Isaac. Now, Abram never was a great nation while he was alive at that time. Isaac never was a great nation. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Started out very small, didn't he? Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and is it Rebekah? And then Jacob and, I get those two confused, uh, Rachel and Rebecca. Anyway, they had a wife. And they began to reproduce. Jacob had 12 sons. And they married, and of course they began to have children, family. Well, there was a famine, and so Jacob goes down into Egypt. It was about 70 people is all it was. But by the time they spent the 250 plus years down in Egypt, and it came out, there were millions of them. And then as time progressed, then those 12 sons grew into, the families grew into nations. And of course you understand the story uh, that they were taken into captivity, the northern 10 tribes, they migrated up into Europe, and we have uh, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Issachar, Simeon, Levi, those 10 tribes, where are they? Did they disappear off the face of the earth? No. Particularly two sons, well actually one son, Joseph, had two sons named Ephraim and Manasseh, and history will prove to you that they became the United States and Britain. He made a great nation. Did he keep his word or not? He certainly did. So through Abraham, they became a great nation. But through Abraham also, he says, all nations will be blessed. Now comes God's plan of salvation through Abraham. He said, you will become Abraham's seed. And so in order to become Abraham's seed, God was going to have to start calling certain people. Now he called a lot of them. He called, if you go into the book of Hebrews, you'll see some of the ones that he called in the Old Testament. And he used them for a particular purpose. You see, in order to bring them into the kingdom, God, he chose Moses to write the book of the law, the first five books. He chose Noah for a specific job, Daniel. And you can look at the Old Testament and you see many of the prophets back there, David, Solomon, those men that he chose and is going to use. A small number. And the only reason he called them at that particular period of time is he had a purpose for them. To bring them along to fulfill his plan. So not many of them were called. Not many at all. But then when we come up to the day that Christ said in Matthew 16 and verse 18, when he was talking to his apostles, he said, I'm going to build my church. He was going to construct it. When you build something, you take it piece by piece and put it together. You start with a foundation. And you start laying the foundation. Then you start filling in and framing it in and building it up from the ground up. A solid, firm foundation. Well, he says, I'm going to be the foundation. And the prophets and the apostles will be a part of it. So you see, it began to build this up. Very, very small. There at the first, on the day of Pentecost, there's only 120 of them. That's not a very big church. <laughs> I'd take it. You know, even today, I'd take that today. But it's not a very big church. 
only 120 to start with. But as he began to go along, he began to add to that church. After the day of Pentecost, it said sometime 3,000, 5,000. And so early on, people were all excited. It was something new. And God, through the miracles that the apostles were able to perform, wanted to be a part of it. Now, the depth of that conversion, I can't say. Because we know that we track it down from 31 A.D. all the way up to 70 A.D. And then 90 A.D., the church had just about disappeared. The church of God. Now, there were still members. But you see, the testing period that they had to go through, many of them failed. And they allowed false prophets to come in and change the religion, their beliefs. They didn't stay true. So, when you get up to... At the, at the end of the century, there around um, 90 A.D., when John was inspired to write the book of Revelation, he goes back and he writes in, in the three books of John, he was even put out of the church. Diotrephes had the preeminence. So, when you look at it in that perspective, you see that God was in the process of sorting out. And he's in that process today of sorting out. Because he's not interested in numbers. He's interested in quality people. Why? Because one day they're going to be members of the God family. Now, members of the God family, I don't, I don't know how many people really know God or not. But God is in every single way perfect. You understand that? Never once through all, all of eternity has either Father or the Son made any sin whatsoever. And they never will because they, their mind's set. Their character is set. Now, if he's going to give you eternal life, you too must come to the point in your life that that character must be set. And that's a process of conversion. Of, as you heard in the sermonette, of meeting those obstacles, those stumbling blocks along the way, and through the help of Jesus Christ living in you, overcoming every single one of them. Now, we can make excuses all along the way. I'm sure there were people back in the early church that made excuses. They won't be in the kingdom of God because they weren't willing to accept and to do all that was required of them. It's not something that, it's not like any other church. Not a mega church. It's not like any other group of people who call themselves Christians. And I may offend some people with this, but I... I'm sorry, there's no other church like the true church of God. There just isn't. Where God is in charge of it. And Christ dwells in the members. There's just no other group or church like it. It's a body united by the Holy Spirit. With people that are growing. With every member doing his or her part. And each one on an individual basis working out his or her own salvation to become like Christ. Because they realize it's adamantly stamped in their mind that the day is coming that they're going to stand before the judgment seat of God and give an account of what they did with the gift that was given to them. They understand that. It's first and foremost in their life. They seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the first priority in their lives. And we must understand that. So you see, God isn't interested in just calling a whole bunch of people. He's interested in working each with each and every one of us on an individual basis to make sure that we come to the point in our lives that we are as much like Him as we possibly can be while we're still in the flesh. Now, having said that, Let's go to Matthew 7. And here's what Christ said about the mega churches and the big churches and the compromising churches and the compromising groups. Here's what he says. Matthew 7 verse 12. Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. What is he saying? He said, this is my way. My way is a way of love. It's a way of give. It's not a way of get. It is, it is my way. And that's what the law and all the prophets was trying to teach you. So he says, therefore, 
Verse 13, enter you in the straight gate. But wide is the gate, and broad is the way, the world's way, that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Do you see that? Many. Many are going to go that way. That's the way of the world. They're looking for big. They're looking for uh, numbers. It's not what God's looking for. Because straight is the gate and narrow. You're barely able to squeeze through it. That is the way, God's way, which leads to life. And he says, I'm here to tell you, few there's going to be that find it. Few. You know why? Because most people want to follow the way of the world. They're focused on the way of the world. They look at the world. They look at the perspective of the world. You know, we got members of God's church that want to get all wrapped up in politics and think that some political uh, man's going to save them. Are you serious? It isn't going to happen. No, no man, no group of men, no political party is going to be able to save us from what's coming. It isn't going to happen. There's only one great being who sits at the right hand of the Father that's going to be able to save us. That's Jesus Christ. And he's not, he's not going to do that. He's not going to set his hand to do that until the time is right, until he returns to the earth. So he's not in the process of saving mankind now. He's going to let mankind go to the very brink. Then he will intervene. Then he will stop it and save us from ourselves. Now that's found in Matthew the 24th chapter. Now let's go over to Acts 20 and verse 35. You see, we want to know what God's way is. Acts 20, verse 35. Paul says here, I have showed you, or Luke, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, God is wanting to... And he sets the precedent. He is willing, wanting to give. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us faith. You, you don't think it's your faith, do you? By grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's of Christ. So you, you have to receive the free gift of the Holy Spirit. You have to receive faith. You have to receive Christ's sacrifice for you to even have your sins blotted out. So he wants to give. And everything he does, he wants to give you. But he's not going to give it to you until you're able to handle it. Till you're ready to deal with it. It comes in measures, if you will. Increments. Now, let's notice Acts 12. Acts 12. Notice verse 32. No, I'm sorry, you won't find it in there, will you? Did you find Acts 12, 32? I didn't either. Let's try Luke. Luke 12, 32. I'm pretty sure it's in here. Now this is Christ speaking. He says, fear not. Notice what he says. Don't be afraid, little flock. He calls them a little flock. A little group. A little congregation. A little church. He said, don't be afraid. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants to give it to you. But you have to do your part, and I have to do my part. Sometimes people look at groups and they think because it's not a large group, it can't be of God. But just on the contrary. If it's a small group, it says here a little flock. But I want to show you something. Anyone that's familiar with the Church of God New World Ministries understands that we have small congregations spread all over the world. But those congregations aren't great, great big churches. It may be only one or two people meeting alone on the Sabbath in their home. I would have been shocked when I came into the church if someone says, oh, we're meeting over in Mr. Smith's home. I would have probably looked at it with John eyes. I would have probably been skeptical. Go to the church. 
We had a pretty church in our community. Our Methodist church is a little white church set right over here on the side of the road. I'll never forget it. The railroad track run by. The little white church set over there. Had a little white fence around it. Had about 12, 13 steps and went up to the platform. Had a bell in the lobby when you went in. It'd ring at 10 o'clock, about 10 till 10 every Sunday morning. Had a white steeple sitting up on top of it. It was pews. We had pews in there. Uh, sanded floors. Pretty. Pretty church. And then for me to go to somebody's home, I would have thought about it. But if you go to Romans, a lot of people don't seem to read the Bible. But here's what it says in Romans 16. Notice verse 3. Two of the great people of uh, Paul's time that helped with the gospel, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, working feverishly to get the gospel out, to do God's will. Verse 3, it says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, likewise, greet the church... Where is that church? In their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ, and so forth. You see, at that time, if you can imagine what was happening in the various synagogues, at some point in time, there had to be a separation between the Jews, who never accepted Christ, and the newly converts that did accept him, and acknowledged him. You know the Jews don't accept him today. They're still waiting on the Messiah to come back. But what would have happened to those people? You read back in the early part of the book of Acts where persecution set in against the church. And many times they had to meet in their homes. But God said where two or three of you are gathered together in my name I will be there. In spirit I will be there with you. So Let's turn to Matthew 13. Let's understand how God works. It's totally different from the way the world works. And you, you've got to understand God's mind, His perspective. You have to understand His plan. You have to stand, understand what it's all about, what He's trying to accomplish. And we understand that, but how many people in this world today do not understand that God is trying to bring many sons into glory? That means he's going to reproduce himself while you're in the flesh. And then at one moment, at his return, there will be a resurrection of all those that are his, that have endured to the end, that have endured all the persecutions, overcome their human nature, resisted the pull of the world, rejected Satan the devil, not given in, and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they will enter into the family of God. Isaiah said, can a nation be created in one day? Absolutely. In a moment. Just like that. All those people that have qualified will have their physical flesh and blood body disappear and they will receive a new body. I know that's hard to believe, isn't it? But that's what your Bible says and that is the plan of God. But the point that we've got to understand is that you've got to become like God. Put on the divine nature. Christ said, become ye perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. And then we come back with the old excuse, well, nobody's perfect. True. Nobody can keep the commandments. Yes, you can with Christ's help. He says, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. That's what Paul said. So you see, here's the way the kingdom of God is. God doesn't start off with mega churches. He's not in the business of saving these people today. No, by the decision Adam and Eve made in the Garden of Eden, he just let mankind eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, make the decision for themselves all the way up till the end. There will be a group of people that will die and be in the grave who has never known Jesus Christ of Nazareth, never known about his plan, never known about the truth about the Sabbath, about his holy days. Will not have known that... Jesus Christ were two spirit beings that wanted to have a family. They will never have known that during this lifetime. So he's not trying to save everyone now. But he is going to try to save everyone through the entirety of his plan. So we read in Matthew 13, 
In verse 31, it says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven is synonymous with the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew just used kingdom of heaven. The other uh, writers used the kingdom of God. Same thing. I had someone email me the other day and ask me the difference between the two. There is no difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in a field which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Can you imagine taking a little old tiny seed? And let's look at the analogy of what God is doing. He started off with a few. He's taking that seed and he put it in the ground and he fertilizes it and he nourishes it. And he trims it as it grows up. You know, testing, trials that go along the way. But that, that seed, that little tiny seed, it grows up into a magnificent tree. And the birds can come and make their little nests in it. You see how the kingdom of God is? He didn't start off big. He started off small. And that's what he's doing now. He's only calling a small select few that he's training. And, and most people can't understand that. Most people don't want to understand it because they think they're right with God. But in essence, they are not. He uses another example here in verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. What does leaven do when you put leaven in dough? Just let it sit there a while and you'll see. It begins to puff up, doesn't it? It, it starts off flat and then it just begins to spread and spread and spread. And then you stick it in the oven and what do you got? A fine loaf of bread. Because of that leavening. And that's the way it is with God's kingdom. It will start off small and it will just begin to grow and grow and grow and grow. It will start off with those that are his that he's coming. Then during the millennium, many more that live over into the millennium will come to the knowledge of the truth. They will receive their opportunity for salvation. And at the end of that millennial reign, when the kingdom of God is established on this earth, and there will be thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, probably ten generations of people, living up to about a hundred years in each age, will be extant when the great white throne judgment is ready to take place. And there are billions upon billions upon billions of people then. Now you're familiar with this, aren't you? But you see, the point I'm trying to say is he starts off small. Very small. Few there be that find it. Not a great number. And as he continues to progress, just like leavening, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it comes to the point in Isaiah 9. And this ought to give you hope. This ought to give you encouragement. This ought to stir you up. It ought to make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It ought to excite you. In Isaiah 9, verse 6, Unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, that that son, one son, one child, started off small, didn't he? One son named Jesus Christ, and he put the government upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Started off as one little child, born from a virgin Mary, and from Christ, through him, the entirety of all of mankind will have an opportunity for salvation. But he started small, then he went to his church, to his group, then the called out ones that he's, he's working with now. Now notice verse 7. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. So what God has in mind for us, I don't know how often you stop and think about it. I don't know how often you meditate on that concept of what lies ahead for you. I don't know if sometimes you may be faced with a particular problem, a particular trial, and it may seem overwhelming to you. But when you start looking at the end and you, you weigh the end result against what you're going through at this particular period of time, there's no comparison, is there? If you can just hang on, he says. If you can just endure. If you can just persevere. Now, I know you've heard all these things before. But it's a matter of actually doing that. Doing it. Of not letting down. Because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, according to the scriptures, as we draw closer to the time of the end, 
And you say, well, we've heard that. Yes, we did. I remember Herbert Armstrong proclaiming with a loud voice, Brethren, we're in the gun lap. You know the gun lap's the last lap. Bam! The gun went off. Round and round the track we went. How many times have we circled that track during that period of time? Maybe we're still in the, the gun lap. I, I don't know how long that last leg will be. You know, in a mile race, it's four times around the 440 track. But I still think we're still probably in that gun lap. We may be in that generation. Uh, I don't know. But I don't set dates. I can't tell you. I don't know. I just don't know. But I do know, according to the Scriptures, that in the last days, it says many will be offended. Many offended and fall from the church of God. And that ties right in with Peter's prophecy about false prophets coming in. And with trials. Sometimes people are overwhelmed with their trials and they just give up. You can't do that. Because the trial is going to be there whether you're serving God or not. You've still got to get through it. So you may as well just hang on and, and stay with God. And who knows what he may do for you. But at any rate, I do think that uh, the church is going to decrease in size up till the time that Christ comes. And I don't know how many is going to be there. Maybe just a handful. I don't know. That will endure to the end. But anyway, that's what I wanted to show you today was the difference between the, the world's way and God's way. God starts off very, very small, and he ends up very, very large. The world usually starts off very large and ends up very small once they have their collapse. So to conclude, I'll just say, fear not, little flock. It's God's good pleasure to give you that kingdom.